It is for me if it is you. It is for us. Yay, welcome Jerry Snodgrass. We are thrilled that you're here and, and we have, I, I think, a lot of questions for you. So we definitely want to jump on. So everyone, we're thrilled to welcome Jerry Snodgrass, who of course is uh, Executive Director of the Ohio High School Athletic Association. And we're seeing a lot of questions come in about um, physicals and if they've been adjusted for fall sports or how are we handling that? What kind of information do you have on the physicals and the expirations on those, Jerry? We have a sport medicine advisory group that uh, is actually meeting tomorrow and has met uh, at least once and has been addressed as discussed by them. One of the issues that we have is that uh, it, it does not comport with the, um, I think the pediatric uh, medicine, uh, I'm missing the term there, but I don't think it's, it's against standards to waive that for a year. I know some states do, but our, ours is currently a 13 month um, that we permit a physical to be used, which actually would take us through the month of June for any of our current athletes. But uh, we also think it's a little too early to say. Uh, we don't want to waive it if things open up enough that our kids can get physicals. We still do believe that it's in the best interest for them to get them. So we're, we're studying it. We've been reviewing it for a few weeks, actually, but a little quick to just turn around and say everybody's free and, and clear on that. Do we have any sense of, you know, for both Jerry and, and Tom about, you know, masks and, you know, now we're seeing that, of course, to go into stores and um, there's a big debate about that, but athletics is a whole other experience. So, you know, thinking about both fans and athletes, you know, are, is, mask, is wearing a mask the answer, part of the answer? Where do we see that? Tom, maybe you could start with that, and then Jerry, we'd love to hear the OHSAA policy on that. Yeah, so the you know the CDC recommends that anyone out in public uh, wear a mask. So if you're out playing sports in public, I, you know that falls under that umbrella. Now, the U.S. Olympic Committee the other day issued their return to play guidelines. It's a pretty long document, and I don't want to speak out of turn there, but I I think they maybe Jerry knows. I think they they may have addressed the the masks and training issue. Um, I think you can expect the CDC um, soon to produce guidance for youth sports. Um, and included in that, uh, I'd imagine, would be uh, a recommendation related to uh, wearing masks during, during training. Um, I think it'd probably be an, an argument for this being a good idea is that in sports, of course, you're constantly violating, certainly team sports, um, you know, that six foot, um, distance. So it's all the more reason to have a, a mask. Um, an argument against using it is people are out there exerting and you don't have the same oxygen flow. What does that mean for athletes, especially those who may have impaired respiratory function? Um, and I think it probably falls back on the coaches too. If this is, you know, I think they have a huge responsibility here to adjust what they are doing what they're promoting. So like driving kids super hard at the start of practices to get them in shape and, and all that. Um, they got to be careful in general with that whole idea because people have been more inactive in, in recent months. But if you've got the masks uh, tied into that, that as well, I mean, what does that mean? Is it really just more of a, a, a slow build? Is it more focused on technique? Is it, I mean, how do you adjust? We need to take this virus spread things seriously um but so i mean I'd, I'd actually be curious to know from jerry what uh what the thinking is at the high school level about how to handle that issue yes you know and it's very interesting i i did not read the u.s olympic committee's uh guidelines or recommendations in its entirety but i believe it said wearing masks where possible i believe it did i'm not 100 sure we have a group that we're putting together we don't want to recreate the wheel, obviously, but we have a group about returning to play or opening things up. One of the biggest challenges we face, uh, I learned today, and I, I, well, let me back up, that the local departments of health are the ones that currently determine a lot of this. And that's challenging for us in school sports because we are interscholastic. So all of a sudden, we have guidelines that could be administered by one county and those guidelines being different in another county where the opponent is. And that's very, very challenging to us. And right now at this point provides us very few answers to that. 
you mentioned, Tom, the um, concern about pushing kids hard. And when we talk about, that's somewhat of a whole different subject, but for us, when we look at guidelines on what we have permissions to do and when we open up practice, our typical start of fall practices is August 1. But if there are so many restrictions during the month of July that that physical activity is limited, we have to remember we have elite athletes in Ohio and a lot of them. We also have about 350,000 total student athletes for the year. And I'm not certain exactly how many fall athletes we typically average, uh, averagely have. But at the same time, we have to understand that a lot of those kids will not have been active, or at least they're normal active. Whether I like it or not, July is so often called preseason. And in the absence of that preseason, we have got to be concerned about acclimation periods for all sports entering into the fall if things open up then. So it is a very complex thing, and especially it goes back to what those restrictions and guidelines are going to be from each individual health department. Right now, I learned today that Franklin County, I wasn't even aware of this, that Franklin County uh, has issued an order. I think it goes with you talking about people being chased off fields, that the order for um, Franklin County is that every single facility must be closed. It must be closed. And I think the order is through June 30th. Well, that's not true in some other counties. So, you know, that, that really is, is complex for us to deal with right now. No question. Well, Aaron, it must have been a, a weird season for you as well. I mean, we all, I, I mean, I was a, a hockey mom for years and, um, you know, the greatest time of my life was watching my son play a sport that he loved. And you watched her, you know, you, you watched Emma prepare so hard and then you didn't get to be part of it. But by the same token, you know, if you said to me, well, you could watch your kid, but uh, she may be susceptible to catching COVID-19 if she competes, uh, that's not a choice I'd like to make. So how do you, um, what's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's unique because, uh, and Jimmy knows, I have, I have three athletes, actually. I have one that was a freshman college baseball player who lost his freshman season. Uh, Emma obviously lost her junior season, which was critical for her because of recruiting and how hard she worked, um, you know, as a freshman, just missing out on states. And then uh, sophomore, you know, realizing that the field got better, but because she played two sports, she didn't. Uh, match the field so she worked really hard for a junior season and is, was right in the peak of recruiting season and then I also have a freshman swimmer that uh, missed out our finals and her championship opportunities and, and actually a trip to Florida for championships as well so uh, we got hit three ways in the house and um, um, you know and then obviously I work for a, a, a sports facility Bo Jackson Elite Sports which got hammered as well by the immediate closure of our facility and so uh, we're, we're seeing it all across. Um, I have, you know, we have travel baseball teams that don't know if they're going to play a season uh, and we're hopeful. And, and um, you know, we, there's just so, so I've seen it across the board. It's affected us um, in many ways, just like everybody else. I mean, it's, it's all relative. Right. But, um, but yeah, so I, I missed out on um, the joy. I think for me as a dad is watching my kids play and, and compete and um, no matter how they do. And, and then if I put my, work had on um, just having a facility that's um, really not able to know right now when we're going to be able to open. Um, so we've, we've had a variety of ways. No question. Well, I, I guess uh, for AJ and, and Emma, I'm curious, um, you know, there, there's, there's always consistent talk about, well, we could open up and play, but we wouldn't have any fans in the stands, which means, you know, we wouldn't have any parents in the stands. Um, okay. How do you guys feel about that? Is it, would you, would it be worth it? What, what would be your feelings about playing before empty stands um, if we had to do that either in the fall or even moving into the next spring? Um, I wouldn't mind it, actually. Um, I mean, I could speak for a lot of people. Nobody really plays, you know, for the fans. I mean, they play for the, the love of the game, and I love baseball. I mean, I could care less if there's um, 10 fans or 1,000 fans. Uh, as long as I'm playing baseball, I'm happy. So that's how I feel about it. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think, um, like you said, it's more for the love of doing it than who's watching. And I honestly would feel like less pressure on my shoulders if there was um, not as many people watching. So I think that was a good idea. Well, Tom, what do you what do you say about that? I mean, does it feel like that's the direction that maybe we should head in? I mean, if 
if, if athletes play for the love of sport and the, the, the attendance factor is not an issue and, and, uh, you know, and I know that we're certainly talking about, you know, more significant mm -hmm. crowds when we're talking about like college football, but it, it, should we just allow people to play for the love of the game? Yeah. I mean, it's really great to hear what AJ and Emma said. I mean, uh, that's the point. I mean, the best part of sports is what you feel and what you learn about yourself and participating. The fans are a secondary thing. It's important for the fans, I guess, certainly in large spectator sports. But at the youth level, at the high school level, it really ought to all be about the athlete first and foremost. Um, that's, so maybe this is actually a silver lining coming out of this, um, that we're able to really focus more on what, you know, students – want and need out of an experience like this and maybe they can take more ownership of it and not feel all these outside pressures i mean this is what love of game intrinsic desire is what um it's, it's what keeps you playing the game into your into adulthood um you know i mean the, with my kids i had a son who played college soccer and uh, you know a daughter was a pretty good uh, field hockey player and otherwise the only thing i ever wanted for them was to be 25, 30 years old, and they're out of my, you know, out of, out of my umbrella, and they want to sign up for the local beer league. They want to keep playing soccer or whatever else it may be, um, and they're just active for life, and they're getting all the benefits of being part of a team structure, even if it's in a casual kind of way. So I think it's, I think it's fine. I don't think we should agonize at all about the, about the, the, the fan piece. Um, let's, let's get let's get kids back playing in the safest form possible. And uh, if somehow we can fit the fans into it, great. If not, yeah, wouldn't agonize about it in the least. You know, uh, Aaron just brought up a, a really compelling and interesting point about recruitment and how important that is at the sophomore level. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, I, I think we really underestimate, um, I'm sorry, at the junior level, and, and I think we really underestimate sort of the impact of that underclass period as you build up to your senior season. You know, Jerry, is there anything that, that, that OHSA is talking about in terms of trying to um, address that in any way, recognizing, you know, at, I mean, at the, at the higher ed level, of course, we're talking about giving people an extra season. You can't really ask people to go to high school for another year. And so how do we compensate, you know, this lost time and, and experience that we're getting? You know, first of all, I'm going to go back to something Tom said about playing. And, and I do appreciate both AJ and Emma's uh, thoughts about playing without fans. I, that's really rewarding to hear. And that is why we do this. I also am going to throw this in. I think, I think I'll do a survey of our officials tomorrow and see what they think about playing without fans. I'm pretty sure I know what that <laughs> survey is going to show. So, <laughs> okay. We saw really so many problems at once. <laughs> the number of officials lately, our numbers may blossom now. So uh, now that aside, you're right. We have actually been inquired frequently about giving kids another year of eligibility. It just is not practical in the high school realm. Um, I don't know, some, AJ, you might want to stick around for another year of high school, but most kids don't. Yeah, uh, I do. That's just a lot of problems. <laughs> I will say that our schools and our coaches, we've challenged them a lot to recognize in some very unique ways, and they've done a wonderful job of that. Um, you know, I think one of the things that an intrinsic value of sport is to, that you learn to deal with adversity. And our seniors have learned to deal with that. All of our kids have learned to deal with that more than ever, whoever expected. And I wish I had a better answer for that, but it is just that. And, you know, we can't go back and redo it. So thank goodness for those that have another year of eligibility, at least. And, and hopefully it's forgotten in time, but, you know, hopefully the sacrifices they made are all reflected in what the young, younger ones behind them have the opportunity to do. Absolutely. Nicole, I think one thing that, that we've thought about is if we are allowed to open at some point, being an indoor facility, is we know that the numbers of people we can have will be limited. And so that may limit, you may only be able to have one parent. Um, or we may, as, as a facility, have to say, um, you know, we can only have one parent because we want to obviously have enough for the athletes. And so you want your numbers to equal out and you want to have room for everybody. But if we allow the entire family to come watch one player, that's let's just say five where it could just be two if it was just dad and, and son or, or, you know, mom and son, whatever it might be. So that, that could affect, you know, obviously none of us know, but 
Um, that could affect fall sports if there's a certain number that can all be allowed. It could only be that one parent's allowed to come watch, or or maybe none. You know, we don't know. We faced that on March 10th when the governor uh, recommended, and it ended up obviously being an order anyhow, but he recommended that we continue our, at the time, regional boys tournaments, and we were entering into state tournaments in hockey, wrestling, and uh, girls basketball. But his recommendation was that we continue, and originally he stated with no fans. Then he quickly adjusted quickly and said, parents only. Well, in my discussion with him, that presents a challenge too. Many have step parents. Uh, so we limited the number to four because of that. And he was in total agreement of that. And we just got beat up right and left because with that number of four, those that had mom and dad then would take two children. And then they had three children. So they had to decide which child. So if one would be a great answer for us. But, but you can see all the residual effects and unintended consequences of these things you're talking about. Gary, I get the sense you get beat up on a lot of different issues, so. I don't <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name's not Jerry right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the territory. Well, I, I do want to uh, introduce uh, someone else who's on this on this call with us, um, and this is my uh, teaching assistant, Colin Ganan, who is a, a rising senior now at Ohio State. Um, he is a journalism student, and he's also the president of our Scarlet and Gray Sports Radio uh, Club. Colin does an amazing job calling sports. Uh, he and I have both lamented the the lack of sports from that aspect, not from our from being athletes, but from certainly uh, exercising our skills uh, around what athletes do. And, and Colin, you had some questions. You you want to ask. Yeah, thanks, Nicole, and thanks for joining everyone. Uh, Tom and Jerry as well, Aaron brought up already travel baseball and the questions surrounding travel and club sports. Uh, what are we seeing as a balance between uh, those travel and club teams and high school sports amid all of this? Um, I'll, I'll speak first to that. Um, you know, I've said this so often that, you know, the clubs and the travels there are good ones, there are bad ones. Um, many of the bad ones are the ones that just pick up on a weekend in some sports. Basketball is a big one in the summer. And there's really no guidance or regulation over them. That worries me a lot. I think there are some great travel baseball and softball programs in the summer that are much more controlled. And why I'm mentioning that is simply that it's difficult for me and understanding what my position is. I work for the state high school athletic association that our coaches who have CPR training, they have sport medicine training, they have all these different trainings, uh, even some dealing with the, dealing with the mental health of, of student athletes that, you know, I'm a champion for that, you know, that I don't want them to be denied opportunities and that other groups have that. And I'm not saying those other groups are bad. I've been accused of, wanting to ban youth sports. I don't want to ban them at all. I just want ours to have that same opportunity for the sacred, the sacredness of high school sports. I don't, I want us to have a level playing ground. And that's very difficult right now uh, because partly because we're entering that summer season and probably the biggest factor in it is so many of these club travel sports utilize school facilities. And that's the big what if, if those are going to be available. We then had a follow-up from Terry asking about suggestions on how to limit club and travel teams from you know, taking over student athletes before coaches are permitted to work with those athletes. And I can say from our perspective, we have no oversight of them. We have zero. And good or bad, I'm sure, AJ, you probably play some form of travel baseball in the summer. I mean, it's yeah. probably a good program. Yeah. OJ, and, actually. And you want to play. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and I'm not sure of the program, but it, I'm sure it's good. I mean, you would be involved in a good program, but there are some that aren't so good, but I also don't want to limit our school coaches. You know, so again, that's the, that's the unknown on all this, whether facilities will be available for our coaches to do those things. And it's not just baseball, softball, whether we like it or not, athletics have become a year round for almost every sport. Well, Tom, I have to throw this one to you, too, then, because we, uh, I mean, you and I had a great afternoon at Ohio State talking about the professionalism of youth sports. Uh, travel is certainly a key component of that. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, 
the playing field has been leveled because there is no competition at all. So mm -hmm. if we had the ability to move from a, an absolute bottom level in leading up this field and build up from it, what would it look like from your perspective, you know, considering some of the questions we're getting about travel and, you know, these different things with coaches poaching and things like that? Yeah, you know, so I mean, you know, Jerry talked about how, you know, interscholastic sports are challenged because you might have one team in one county and another and another and another different jurisdictions. I wonder if one of the outcomes of this, uh, of this challenge that everyone's facing now, the economic challenge and the, the health challenge is the reemergence of uh, intramur intramural sports, um, more locally based sports uh, that, you know, engage a um, larger number of kids um, at lower price points and just don't, aren't, aren't uh, quite as much of a tug on the finances of athletic departments. Um, I mean, Jerry can speak to some of the challenges there. Of course, there are space challenges. Where would you, where would you put this stuff? You know, where would you put the additional play? Are there community partnerships that come into, is it a matter of working more closely with the park and recs or the, the YMCA's or, uh, you know, other, other providers in your area? But I think that's that's a really interesting it's a really interesting opportunity given that you know when our data show that m most kids in this country actually don't play sports on a regular basis, but that most kids want to play sports. They're just sometimes it's hard for them to break into. They're not as good of an athlete as AJ or you know Emma. Or, I mean, just they're, they're they're not elite. They're just sort of average or even below average, but they have a desire to play. So can we create more forms? for those kids, you know, to play sports, improving their, their health. And, you know, we know that kids who play sports do better in school and go on to college more often and have lower, you know, uh, incidence of chronic diseases and get better jobs and more active as adults. So, you know, is that potentially an opportunity here is to re begin to rethink um, the most viable, you know, the, 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 the model for high school sports. Uh, make room for the you know the good athletes, but also can we bring back some of these forms that are more affordable and uh, you know just keep more more locally based play. Tom brought up a very good point that about you know we we've looked. It may sound very far fetched, but the bottom line is if fall sports would get canceled or fall sports would be played without fans, then the economic blow of that to high schools the an athletic department in the high school survives for the most part on revenues from five home football games. And without that, this may sound very off the wall, but we've just even talked about how do we reinvent ourselves? And for that very reason, have kids active, have kids, can they compete in a different way? You know, does it have to be interscholastic? And you mentioned the intramural program. And I know it sounds off the wall, but anything to get our kids active and be able to play what they love to play yeah emma and aj a question to both of you um how has not been able to play during this time impacted you physically and psychologically you know at the end of this season and then leading up to the next year yeah for me um i'm a three-sport athlete so I'm, I'm pretty busy um i mean right now i mean my whole life has changed i mean usually i go to school um, then I go to practice for two hours after school and then I just repeat that, you know, five days a week and then some on Saturdays. And I mean, right now I'm just trying to, you know, finish my online school, um, you know, work out, you know, because I'm going to college and I have to, you know, stay, stay strong doing that. Um, but right now, I mean, my, my whole life has, has pretty much changed in the opposite direction. So that's how it, yeah. Yeah, um, I can agree. I definitely feel like I'm always busy with sports and school and extracurriculars. So just like the drop of everything is just um, something I've never experienced before. So it's definitely been weird to adjust to. But um, like AJ said, I've just been working on school and um, just trying to better myself during this time so that next year could um, look better. AJ, you mentioned working out. How much are you able to work out with all of this? Um, I'm able to work out um, once a day um, in my basement. So, I mean, it's it's not, you know, like it's it's more than what I would do um, during the season, but also um, the reps, the live reps that I'm missing out, um, it, it affects me and it will affect like everybody's game 
you know, because nobody's allowed, you know, allowed to get live reps and all that. So that affects me. I'm also curious, um, you know, there's the idea that uh, uh, division, especially at division one level, that athletes are going to be able to stay, student athletes be able to stay for their senior year again, which could, you know, I, I work a lot with the Ohio State baseball team academically. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one of the great moments when the freshmen come in is realizing that space opened up because the seniors have left. How do you yep. guys think that's going to affect you? Um, you know, Emma, God willing, you know, you do, uh, if you want to compete in college, you get to, um, and AJ, you know, what are, what has anyone said to you from a coaching standpoint and, and where's your thoughts on this? So luckily for me, we have two returning seniors coming back to play baseball at OU. So it's not, um, a big, you know, it's not like the whole senior class is coming back. And then one person in, uh, my 2020 class decommitted. So really there's just, um, one person, you know, that's kind of, you know, the, out of the ordinary, the senior coming back. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, it affects, you know, bigger programs, you know, they'll, they'll bring in, um, I know more senior classes, uh, for the seniors are coming back and then they're bringing in 15 people. So, I mean, with a 35 man roster, it, it, it everybody. Yeah. So. Emma, are you thinking about it at this point? Um, yeah, I mean, I, personally would like I understand why they would come back and um I feel like that it's fair to them for them to have the chance to have another season especially since it's your senior season and it's college so it's like your last sport ever so um I get why they would come back so I think I would be okay with it and accepting so Matt's asking, Jerry, if you see a scenario where some areas of the state return to play and others don't, and is there a scenario where more individual sports like golf or tennis, um, you might even argue some aspects of track could come back, but team sports like football would not? And that, that's a very good question on that. I'll start with the second part of that. Uh, I, I would not rule out that, I mean, right now there are basically two sports for us that can be naturally social distanced, and that's uh, tennis and golf, um, maybe some others, but we also can't compromise the game. We can't have an umpire standing behind the fence or, you know, we just can't do that. That compromises the very, uh, aspect of fair play and everything else. But so I see that as possible. I think that'll probably rank a lot of feathers, but on the other hand, we might have a heck of a lot of tennis players across the state or a lot of golfers, you know, so I, I don't necessarily believe we should cancel everything just for that. The biggest challenge we face, and I can honestly tell you, I didn't think this would be the case two weeks ago, but I, I think one of the biggest challenges we're going to face is if some areas of the state can and others can't, truly, what do we do? Now, again, I think it brings the biggest challenge because I hate to say no to everybody, but we'd almost be forced to because of schedules. One county playing, well, we could never – never be certain that you could uh, compete against somebody else in another county. Th their health rules, their Department of Health rules might say no, and another one might say yes. So in that case, though, I can see where we could be forced. I think, I know superintendents want us to do that. Uh, again, we'd be the shield of that. And uh, I, I don't want to think that goes with the territory, but that may be a, a tough decision we're going to have to make. Is there the potential for, you know, Jason's asking about um, fall sports moving to spring or spring sports moving or, you know, any kind of reconfigure. I mean, I guess that's one of the most interesting things. And, and I want you all to maybe touch on this. In theory and reality, we have the chance to reset everything. Like we, you know, that we've been doing the same things over and over again. And in many ways they've worked, but they're also what we're used to. It's, you know, they've been, I mean, you, you, I know you can't believe this at five foot one, but I played high school basketball. I played sports in high school and this, everything was the same then. And I'm like 52. So if we had the opportunity to kind of reshuffle things and change when sports take place or how they take place or where they take place, what do you guys think we should do or, or should we change anything? Tom, you want to start us there? Um, and I'm going right yeah. to you, Aaron, so you got to yeah. be ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I uh, look, I do think this is a big reset moment. Um, it's not possible to go, to go into and come out of a crisis uh, without some shift in the model. It's always happened, um, you know, looking back historically. So 
I think the key question is, are we going to come out of this with a model that is more inclusive and more focused on the health of uh, the individual students and athletes? Or are we going to come out of this with a model that is more exclusive, more focused on just elite athletes and premium opportunities? Um, and it's even more about chasing the college scholarship and, uh, you, know, ex, you know, extrinsic downstream return on investment. Um, my hope is it's the former. You know, it really is. It's, uh, I think there are going to be plenty of opportunities for elite athletes to advance through the system of playing college and or professional or, or otherwise. But I would like to see this as a, an opportunity to really build the base of kids who are uh, falling in love with sport, you know, at an early age, uh, having a sustained experience. Our data show that kids only play sports, uh, up any given sport, no more than, you know, 2.9 years or so. They, so they, they start and they, they, they wash out really quickly. There's a very high churn rate. So we, we've got to improve the quality of the experience. And that, that, that means better uh, coach education, coach training. That means uh, really dialing into the needs of what kids and want. I mean, the, we talk about youth sports being youth sports, but if we're really honest with ourselves, it's uh, designed by adults for adults, well-meaning folks, but we rarely bring the voice of, of students into the equation, you know, and, and survey them before seasons and talk to them afterward and really say, hey, listen, what, what does good look like to you? I mean, what, what is fun to you? What are you hoping to get out of this season? It's very kind of top-down uh, structure. I mean, you talked to, you know, Nicole about things that haven't changed in 50 years. It's still that, that, you know, command and control kind of model that we're looking at. So I would love to see something where we have like, the, the voice of, 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 of kids, of students is really built into the design. You know, I want to have room to be able to play three sports during the year. I want to have this type of experience. Um, and then and then build it from there because this is what the video game companies do. We complain about the, you know, how much time kids spend on video games, but they pay very, very close attention to the kind of competition experiences that kids want. Lots of action, right? lots of access to the action, no punishment if you screw up. Um, you know, you start and stop when you want, um, social experience, just there's no physical activity. So I would like to see us learn and redesign youth sports and school sports in a manner that is more aligned with the needs uh, and, the, and, and the health of, of, uh, of students. What about you, Aaron? Uh, you know, I think it's interesting um, because I think we'll learn a lot this summer. You know, it, um, is, if the fields are closed, and the ballparks are closed and the amusement parks are closed and the water parks are closed and the zoo is closed and, and all those places where people go. Um, I think the line in, in Jurassic Park, they said nature will find a way and, and the kids are going to find a way. So, I mean, you see it already today. If you go outside, you see hammocks and um, both of my daughters now have skateboards. Um, I saw um, a former NBA player tweeted yesterday that um, this could be the best thing because pick up basketball you might get, you might lose and have to be kicked off the, the court the rest of the day because you lost and it can create, then you go home and realize, do I want to keep playing this sport or not? Um, so it almost dials back a little bit to days when, not to sound like the old guy, but um, like when we were growing up, when you, you got on your bike and you went and played basketball and maybe you played baseball the same day. I mean, you know, Bo himself, two sport athlete, um, you know, I think we could see that this summer if all these other leagues and things are canceled, it's almost to Tom's point. We could see kids start to say, well, I, all right, well, I'll just go play some pickup basketball with my friends. They might even be a basketball player, but they are now um, because there's nothing else to do. So I think this summer could be very interesting and in it could create a lot of opportunities for kids to try new sports, to find ways to play the sport that they love. Uh, it may be in a grass field without a single white line on it <laughs> with, uh, you know, paper plates as, as bases. Um, you know, and those are the days that – back in the days before we had the incredible facilities we have today. So I don't know, but I think that's what you could see this summer. Um, if, if things are locked up, they're going to find a way to play because that's what they want to do. And, and, and I think we want that for the kids in some ways is we want them to be able to, to exercise and, you know, um, get out and not just sit around the house all day and binge watch Netflix like, <laughs> like some of us are doing right now. <laughs> Yeah. Jerry, I don't want to put that's I totally hear you. And Jerry, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I got to be honest, we have a lot of uh, people invested in Ohio High School um, athletics on this 
on our session with us, and they they're looking for a timeline about when decisions will be made. Um, you know what? Where do where do we stand in terms of uh, making decisions about uh, what restrictions will or will not be made in place? You know, economics are at play here. We have you know Ellis is asked saying that if there's no football, we're gonna have a really hard time paying for a lot of sports. So what can you tell us about the you know the planning going on behind the scenes for a timetable for addressing some of the really you know significant concerns that that come down to the brass tacks of, of money in some cases. You know, one of the things I've often said, and probably say it too much, but I'm a Jack Reacher fan and all the Jack Reacher books. And one of his favorite quotes in there and sayings all the time is, hope for the best and plan for the worst. He doesn't say hope for the best and expect the worst. It's hope for the best and plan for the worst. So we've tried to throw every scenario. We continue to do that. Some of them are laughable at times, but we, we usually pick something off of that. Something sticks against the wall that we talked about. We've tried to be we've tried to be careful and not setting deadlines and dates too soon. Um, that way we're not going back and changing them continually and adding confusion. So, you know, we, th the other side of that, good or bad, is we have to rely on what the Department of Health regulations are going to be, as well as the state superintendent of schools and the Ohio Department of Ed. So we've kind of gone with their guidelines and we'll set those dates out there and we feel we can always adjust, but we're not adjusting every day. So when it comes to fall sports, um, I would tell you that today on May 7th, we're going forward that we will start practices on August 1. That's what we're, so we're not really throwing much out there about any other dates. There were some things out there that really stirred the pot on moving spring sports to the fall. You started to say that a little while ago. Um, that is very problematic in high school. If we move spring sports to the fall, AJ, you just got denied a season, and if the fall were denied, you'd get denied two of them. Yeah. And even though last fall, I know you were in football, but we had the best fall baseball weather we could have ever had. Next year, this next coming fall, it could be the worst. So exactly. let alone we have multiple sport athletes, let alone the other thing is we have a lot of schools – that are in leagues with other state schools. And as soon as that came out, oh my gosh, the executive directors of other states called me and said, what are you doing? Um, because that's very problematic. And we didn't put it out, so we squelched it. So, but we're going forward that, you know, we will start August 1. If not, we have plans to start late. We have plans to start late term. We have plans to, okay, now we have to cut off and play shortened seasons. We have to make sure as we talk about that, we have schools that have 10 team leagues in football. Uh, if you can't get 10 games in, you know, they need to start having that discussion. So it, it's so much of a moving target that, but, but that's why dead, our only deadline really right now is that on June 1st, our no contact period will end and our coaches can have contact. That's the only real deadline we have. And given that, if the stay-at-home order stays till June 30th, we will probably extend it. But I think that gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot more certainty with our schools. Yeah, and I, I want to kind of support Jerry on this. I understand why people want, want, want deadlines and, and decisions, but it really behooves everyone to be cautious. You know, the, the CDC is putting out its guidance around return to play. The USOPC just put out theirs. The state federation, high school federation, is going to be putting out theirs soon. Uh, there, there are legal and liability considerations, Jerry. I don't know if you've, you've talked to lawyers, but like if you, if you throw an event and someone gets COVID and God forbid dies from it, what are the, who's liable for that? You know, I mean, these are all very real considerations um, that just unfortunately we just can't resolve, um, you know, in the next two hours. Correct. I wish we could. God, wouldn't we be the most popular uh, webinar in town? Um, I could start binge watching some of those shows. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jerry, I, I do. I mean, I, I totally hear their concern. And, you know, a year ago, um, 
you know, I, I was a parent of a, of a student who was a, a student athlete. And, you know, Kelly's asking about the 10 day, you know, practices that you get prior to competition. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of logistics that we've worked out over years. And, you know, and, you know, you know, my son played hockey, we, we worked out, you know, time and space to do checking clinics and things. There's such detail involved in this. How do we confront that when you, when you have, you know, the schools need answers, the parents need answers, um, and everybody's trying to make a plan based on the rules that we once knew. Um, how do you answer that? Well, it's tough. I, I will say that every single person on this today shares one very good common belief. We all want it back. We all want it back. None of us are doing anything to inhibit it. I've mentioned that to many people, I did it on a uh, uh, Zoom uh, conference today with 100 and some athletic directors in Northeast Ohio that the most critical thing for us for the fall sports is what we're doing right now. If we open it up and just go crazy, fall sports are in trouble. Right. Uh, and almost, we can almost all agree to that. So, um, you know, it, it's a very tough thing to give an answer to all those people, but just knowing that every single person, um, we all want it back and we're going to follow the safeguards. And, and I've said that a lot of people, I'm sure we've all been faced with this, but I have tons of people uh, that will write me or email me and say, you should let us make the decision. Um, we should sign a waiver uh, if we want to do that. We, I can't do that. I, I just cannot do that and never would. So if people disagree with that, they disagree with that. But so that's challenging. I will tell you that. Well, uh, Travis is asking if no contact ends June 1, but schools or properties are closed. Um, and facilities are not able to be used, where do coaches have contact? They won't. We will extend that if, they, if that's the case. We were under the impression, well, we made calls on this before we put that out, that there was a good chance that that uh, health department order could be amended. They put it out to June 30th, and so we felt, you know, we monitored every single day, and we're waiting even though sometimes we have to listen to the news conference to find out. But I do have a weekly meeting with the governor's office and the state superintendent. So I get a little bit of guidance on where we're headed. So if, if they would amend that, it goes back to June 15th, we'll extend our no contact to June 15th. If it stays at June 30th, we will put the same. So um, June 1st is a safe date for us right now. You know, a question that I, I, I want to throw out, um, to both Jerry and, and Tom and, and even Aaron, if you have thoughts, anyone have thoughts, you know, um, I don't, I don't mean this to sound indelicate, but a lot of sports deals with money now. Um, you know, I mean, the, your, the Aaron, your facility does not run on air. Um, and even the parks and recreation um, facilities, you know, we all need money to make opportunities for kids to play. Um, and this has got to be hurting pretty dramatically. We know at Ohio State, if we don't have Ohio State football, that's going to be a significant problem. And Jerry, if you don't have football uh, come this fall, that's going to be a big hit for you. So when we, when we consider the monetary implications of this, um, how, will we, how will we approach that, you know, recognizing that there's needs on all sides? Real quick, from my standpoint, we've already, we, you're right, we don't like to talk about it much because we're in the business to serve our schools. Uh, we took with the cancellation of our winter, most of our winter tournaments and our spring tournaments, uh, we took a $2 million hit. I mean, we did a huge financial analysis. We lost $2 million. Recouping that is tough. Last Friday, probably one of the most challenging things I never thought I would have to do. But we had huge staff cutbacks, and we're a small staff anyhow, and huge uh, salary cuts. And we cut a lot of things trying to maintain still the service to schools. So there's no question, it's a financial impact and we're, we're trying to meet it, not on the shoulders of our, we don't wanna raise ticket prices $5. Uh, so we're doing our part. Will we have to make some adjustment? We might. Yeah, I mean, I would love to see some relief um, provided. I mean, some recognition by policymakers that sports are important to communities. Um, school sports in particular, uh, park and recs uh, in particular, those, those entities that engage kids at scale. Uh, nothing wrong with the, the individual travel team club operator who's, you know, 
really training up and working hard with a group of 15 kids or something. That's fine. But I think the priority is what are the, what are the institutions that are uh, really engaging the largest number of kids? And then how do we provide some kind of um, relief, financial relief? Um, and I'm thinking about different models on how to do that. And other people have ideas as well. I haven't heard of a one that's actually right so far that we've wanted to support and get behind. But, um, but I, I think it's important. And that may take a little bit of time as well, because right now policymakers are thinking about, you know, like a third of all kids in this country or something or don't, don't have food. Um, and unemployment insurance is running out. And there are all these near-term needs, as much as we all believe in sports and how critical they are to communities. I think policymakers right now are focused on um, other items, but maybe as we move along, federal policymakers, state, maybe local, uh, can really think hard about, um, you know, uh, you know, how, how to keep the, the the key institutions in place to to to, to engage kids. We're just, there's just going to be some pain, some pain in the interim, and uh, and hopefully, uh, hopefully the key the key institutions are still there to serve kids. Yeah, I mean, for us, I think it's, um, I saw uh, early on in this, Simon Sinek mentioned to his team, I saw a Zoom call that was recorded for his team. And, and what he told them is um, he kind of walked through companies that didn't reinvent themselves as they went along. Um, and one, you know, the one that I remember off the top of my head was Blockbuster, um, you know, and, and now they're gone. Um, and so I think this is forcing not just sports facilities, but across the country, companies are going to have to reinvent themselves. Um, in ways I believe we'll have to reinvent ourselves as well um, and find ways that we can, we've always wanted, you know, we always want to not just be about income, but we want to be about serving the athlete and growing athletes inside out. And so, um, you know, the one place we already saw, for example, would be college uh, players need a place to play this summer. A lot of those leagues are being canceled. Um, so we're going to provide a, a place for them to train and be ready, you know, for players like AJ when they hit in the fall they're gonna to have to show up on campus ready. Um, so to be a resource, but also that's a, an opportunity for income for us. Um, you know, and so we're trying to balance that as well, but I think every company is gonna to have to reinvent themselves and can't go back to the way we were March 15th. Um, and I think that's every company, not just sports facilities. And, and I would add that I think there's gonna be, um, the, the whole value proposition for youth sports, certainly in the teenage years is changing. You know, what, what we're hearing from a number of colleges, not Ohio State, but some that don't have as much money is they're like, look, we can't afford to have scholarships in all of the, you know, the minimum of 16 different sports. And they petitioned the NCAA and the NCAA so far has pushed back on it. But they're going to be more of those conversations. I can entirely see or wouldn't surprise me if there are fewer athletic scholarships that are available uh, for kids out there. And if that's the case, how does that change the value proposition about, you know, what type of programming is offered uh, up to kids? Is the college pipeline is as readily accessible as it was in the past? And is the payoff um, as much there as it is right now? And you see, so I think everybody has seen, you know, Urbana University closed. Uh, University of Cincinnati dropped their soccer program exactly. very quickly. I believe Ohio State probably has more sport offerings. Um, I don't know about the scholarship aspect of it than just about any any Division One school. Thirty-six. And I, those would be challenged. How many? Thirty-six. Thirty-six. And I know that I've heard numbers that you know so many other power conference schools. You know, just incredibly lower number than that. And I, that you're right. That's going to be challenging. And I'd love to hear what Tom just said that with less scholarships in those, you know, th that has an effect on us on, I say reinventing ourselves, but for the true meaning of sport, that it's not just chasing that college scholarship. Absolutely. Jerry, uh, we definitely want to mention, Kelly's interested in, in marching bands, so we want that to stay on your radar in terms of whether or not they would be allowed to engage. Um, so I just want to make sure that you see that question. Um, and then we, and Julius is asking questions about officials and, you know, the age of them and, and their pre-existing conditions. And I think, you know, that opens up a lot of, and, and we're, we're end of time, so I'm going to use this as our last kind of um, our wrapping up question. But 
you know, there, I have no doubt that there's some people out there that would say sports is not worth it. Like we have a life or death crisis going on right now. Um, we have no idea how we're going to be controlling it without a vaccine. This idea that we're discussing whether or not, you know, a bunch of people can sit around and watch other people play a sport is not super, it's, it's not relevant or it's not the most important thing that we could be focusing on. Um, and I don't think any of us would be here if we truly felt that way, because I think we, we view sports um, in a much bigger way than just simply what happens on a field or a court or, or a track. Um, so how would you answer that? If, if somebody were saying to you, look, we're wasting time talking about sports when we have so many bigger issues at play here, how would you respond in terms of, of what sports means to us as a society? AJ, could you start? Um, I mean, sports to me is like my whole life. You know, I grew up, grew up playing sports. Um, I've met all my friends playing sports. Um, it's, you know, it's a way, it's like a stress release for me. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just making memories, you know, like we won States for baseball back in 2018. And I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, you know, on that, that Saturday night, um, it was perfect weather and in the dog pile, um, it was just awesome. And, um, I mean, sports are everything for me. So if, if there's no sports, I mean, for some people I see, you know, how, um, you know, sports are like not that big of a deal, but you know, for for us um, and the people who are involved in sports, it it, it impacts us and, and everything that we do. So, I hear you, Emma. What would you say? Um, I definitely agree. I think that like I grew up doing sports, and I think that's so much of who I am and um, how I learned to become like who I am today is through sports and all the lessons, the life lessons I've learned are from sports and from coaches and um, from peers who are in the sports with me. And like you said, the memories are so important and like um, really important to me. So I think that um, just like thinking of a life without sports is just um, crazy to think about and totally different. Well, Jerry, I know that you and I would probably not be employed if there wasn't sports. So <laughs> what would you say? That, that is very true, you know, kind of go back to what both of them said, you know, we just launched a campaign and on um, social media, it's called How I Compete. And, you know, we really identified that why kids do, why kids do play high school sports. You know, they do it to, they do it to have fun. And I know sometimes they'll say, well, the fun is, no, they have fun competing. They have fun playing the sport. Two, they develop relationships and they value those relationships. I talked about the players I coach you know, clear back in the 70s. And what do they still call you? They still call you coach. The relationships are so incredible. But thirdly, you know, they just love to compete. And I think that's one of the biggest things about this is that, that yeah, you know, there are lifelong lessons in it. I think those lifelong lessons, I say, just like Tom said earlier, there are things rise out of a crisis. And I keep saying that we're going to rise out of this stronger than ever. And I think all of those good values of competition uh, are, need to rise out of it. And if we don't, and we don't focus on them, I think we're making a huge mistake. So I think the leadership of our coaches is so important going forward with this. And Tom, you've seen it from all sides, from your time in the media, from the work that you've been doing with, with Aspen. Um, you know, how do you sum up what sports means to us? I mean, we, we wouldn't be America without sports. I mean, really, seriously. We, the 20th century would not have been the American century if we did not invest at the front end of it in school sports, which is a uniquely American experiment, uh, in, in urban parks to give kids places to play, in PE, which was instituted at that time. Um, you know, I mean, this is, this is the foundation on, on which – uh, pro sports is built. We didn't start with pro sports and then, you know, went down. We, we started with the idea of, of, of kids playing sports uh, and, and building greener communities where people could come together and, you know, whatever, compete and so forth. Um, I mean, it, it, that, that's what built a century of soldiers and, and corporate leaders and, um, you know, uh, it, it built a foundation of our society. So, I think that is deeply embedded and I have no doubt that that will be part of our idea moving forward. I think the real question is, are we going to have the structures in place 
meaning, you know, what is the model for school sports? What's the model for community recreation? Um, what exactly is the pipeline? How do the clubs and the, and the schools work together? And this is one of the things I'm concerned about. My son plays high school soccer for a very, very good team here in California, one state last year, and he also plays club soccer. And both of the coaches are rare to get going again in July. And they're like, yeah, we're going to get all in our games. And I'm like, holy cow, these kids can go from zero to 70. And nobody's talking to each other. So my hope is that we come up with a more integrated model that is more, that puts the, 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 the student and the child first. Uh, and then whether you won state or your, you know, your adult competitive uh, ideas, second. So we can get there. It's going to take leadership. It's going to take, um, uh, um, you know, it's going to take some bold policies and some experimentation. Um, but as long as we have the voice of kids and, and you know, at, at the center of it, um, and, and we need to bring them into it, then I think we can end up in a better place. Absolutely. Well, I thank you all so much for being here with us today. It has been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. I do want to let you know that every Thursday, the Sports and Society Initiative brings you a conversation on different aspects of sport. Uh, next week, we are going to be talking with uh, walk-ons and see what that experience is like from the Ohio State perspective. Danny Hummer and Joey Lane will be with us. Um, and the following week, we are going to be meeting with the voices of the Columbus Blue Jackets. So we have uh, Bob McGilligan and Jean-Luc Grandpierre, as well as as Jeff Svoboda. We're going to talk about what it's like to be hockey uh, writers and broadcasters when there is no hockey. Um, and I also hope that you will check our website, sportsandsociety.osu.edu forward slash events for all of our events. This coming Tuesday, we're starting a special series about name, image, and likeness. Um, and we're going to be meeting with uh, Luke Fedlam, who's an expert in that topic. He's an attorney um, in Columbus who deals with uh, sports law. And we also have a special guest with uh, JT Barrett and Karen Weaver from Drexel University. So we hope that you'll join us to learn exactly what it means, name, image, and likeness, the new policy, and what the effect will be on athletics as we know it at the collegiate level. So again, we are thrilled that you joined us. Thank you so much, Tom Ferry. Thank you so much. AJ, thank you so much. Aaron and Emma, thank you so much. Jerry Snodgrass, Colin, thanks for your help. And we hope that we will see you next week. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Thank you.